So I would like to say welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. This is great. We have a great turnout uh, today for our seminar, so I'm very pleased to see that. And hopefully we have a great turnout on the web as well, if not now, then later when the program is archived. Um, I did want to point out that this is the first in the winter seminar series and that we have a list of um, a number of seminars. So if you want to pick up the uh, list and see what else is happening, you are most welcome to do so. They're also advertised on our website. Um, I just want to say on behalf of our acting director, Dr. Gary Roden, and our director who's on sabbatical, Dr. Lynn McDonald, uh, welcome to the Institute for Life Course and Aging. We are very, very pleased today to have with us Dr. Lynn Hasher. Lynn is a senior scientist at Broadman, which is uh, at Baycrest, and she's also um, a professor here at the University in the Department of Psychology. We were very lucky to have Lynn um, at an earlier seminar series discussing her research on circadian rhythm, um, or as she's looking at it now, circadian arousal. And so we're very pleased to have her back and to talk about regulation and distractibility in, the, in aging. Um, thank you so much, Lynn, for coming today. And uh, you can take it away. Just give you a second to get to your computer there. Okay. Uh, well, I come in with winter, the first seminar of the winter <laughs> series with the coldest day. <laughs> Um, I also wanted to note that uh, the early announcements that went around uh, promoted me or demoted me, I'm not really sure which, um, a, a PhD to an MD, uh, and uh, my mother would have been very happy <laughs> if I had actually gone to medical school, but a summer of working in a hospital while I was in college was enough to persuade me that um, research was my was my place and I guess at the time I was naive enough to not really understand that there were MD PhDs out there but um, in any event I have a PhD not an RD as it's known in my family so for a real doctor um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that expression yeah. sorry <laughs> uh, okay so I'm going to talk about distraction regulation and aging, and I just want to begin by saying that uh, the vast majority of research in cognitive psychology, which is the field that I come from, and the subfield that I'm in, memory, um, deals with uh, performance uh, regarding target information, information that uh, you either intend to pay attention to or information that experimenters tell you to pay attention to. Um, and uh, that's really quite interesting, but as it happens, the world is filled with lots of non-relevant or distracting information at any given moment. And in the history of cognitive psychology, we've rarely considered the role that distraction plays in processing. Um, and we never have thought to test for a memory for distraction. And that's really fine if what you're doing is studying the cognitive performance of young adults, the memory of young adults, uh, probably uh, ignoring distraction uh, probably gives you a good picture of what it is that young adults can do. But as you will see, the failure to take into account the role of distraction in cognition uh, in the cognitive functioning of older adults gives us a very impoverished picture of the cognitive functioning of older adults. And so what I'm going to do today is to try to give you a richer picture of what it is that older adults can and do do, because unlike young adults, older adults pay a great deal of attention to distraction. So let me begin with um, just a tiny bit on theory. Mostly I'm just going to talk about empirical findings. And uh, the theory side, um, uh, the nice red on my screen doesn't show up here, but um, the theory side of this is tied to a rich literature in attention, uh, which basically shows that if anything familiar at all shows up in the environment, it triggers representations in the mind of those um, objects, of those people, of those sounds. 
And in order to do a task, to focus on whatever is relevant in a situation, the argument is that you need to suppress the non-relevant information so that you can focus on the relevant information. This activation of representations by familiar objects is thought to be virtually automatic. Uh, that is, you need to be largely comatose in order to have this activation side of things not functioning. But the deactivation side is a critical side, and um, there are age, uh, individual differences, and time of day differences in the ability to deactivate representations, but not much difference in the ability to activate representations. And as it happens, the ability to deactivate representations is diminished with age, and it's also less effective at non optimal times of day. And if there's time, I'll, I'll talk some about that. So what I am basically going to talk about today is um, the consequences of poor distraction regulation, because this is key to understanding the cognitive functioning of older adults. And I'm going to talk about two kinds of effects. One are effects that occur concurrently with whatever task it is you're going to do, that is distraction in the immediate environment. And the other set of effects that I'm going to talk about are subsequent or downstream effects of the distraction that had occurred in one environment and its impact on performance later. Uh, and I'm going to make the case that um, older adults actually have greater tacit or implicit knowledge of distraction than young adults do, and they are more likely to rely on this knowledge um, in the future than young adults do. And that uh, this reliance is part of a compensatory mechanism that enables older adults to actually function uh, quite well under some um, circumstances. So that's the picture and the basic uh, finding that I'm going to show you is that if you don't suppress distraction, you have encoded much more information and have greater access to that information. So uh, I'm going to begin. Oh, it's not a very good um, picture, unfortunately. This is a picture of a middle-aged lady who is at a famous museum in uh, Marion, Pennsylvania, the Barnes Foundation. A uh, famous and kind of wacky museum. Um, wacky because uh, I hope you can see. Let's see, is this? Oh yeah, this will work. So, um, unlike many, many museums, the Barnes Foundation has a tremendous amount of information on every wall. Many, many paintings, and also many, many other things. Because Dr. Barnes, the man who did this collection was interested in all sorts of things, including door hinges, um, and furniture, and candlesticks, and uh, various and sundry kinds of tchotchkes of all sorts. And uh, he, he very carefully laid out everything in the museum. It's his plan uh, that determines what is uh, placed where. So now I want you to imagine yourself a middle-aged person who's taking an art history class whose assignment is to write a paper on the artwork that she is looking at that's directly in front of her. And the question is, what's the impact of all the other works around the target on her versus on a young uh, person who's taking that same art history class? And basically, that is what I'm going to um, uh, tell you about. The impact is going to depend on your age, on where you are in your circadian cycle, and actually within an age group on individual differences. Um, so uh, here's the outline of the talk. I'm going to begin by talking about concurrent distraction, that is distraction that's present while you're doing a particular task. And then I'm going to turn to talking about downstream effects, that is the effect of distraction in one situation on performance in another situation. And then if there's time, I'll talk about time of day effects having to do with uh, the downstream effects, which I think are most interesting and most unusual given, given the bulk of the cognitive literature. OK. So, so you know, our participants are university students who range in age typically from 18 to about 26. 
And our older adults range in age from 60 to 75, and they are healthy and typically have at least some university education. So virtually all our studies are comparison studies of this cross-sectional uh, design. We have some data on young kids. We have some data on people across the entire adult lifespan, but this is restricted to these uh, cross co cro uh, designs in which we compare younger and older adults. So I'm going to show you three sets of findings using three different tasks, which will reoccur in my talk that shows the disruptive effects of concurrent distraction. And the first of these, one of these is a reading task, another is a speed task, and a final task is a verbal problem solving task. So basically what I'm going to show you is that older adults' performance, no matter how you measure it, is differentially impacted by the presence of distraction. That is, they pay a bigger cost, typically for distraction in an environment. So here's our reading with distraction task, which we have used now, um, first used it in 1991, and we have continued to use it because it turns out to be such a rich and useful task. Here's the um, task, you, uh, the target text is actually in italics, which doesn't really show up all that well here, but what you're doing is reading a series of passages uh, of this sort. The car ride was getting bumpy you now that George had left the main highway to use the dirt road. We read this out loud. We measure how long it takes you to read four to six of these passages. And then in the hard condition, you read with distraction, and the distraction are words that are presented in upright font. So again, this is a little hard to see here. Uh, I'm good at the first sentence because I've just read it to you, so I'm going to start down here just to reveal my age. Um, classes had ended for the school year and did not, and George did not have to study during the summer break. Okay. So what I'm measuring is how long it takes you to read when there is, when words serve as distractors versus when extremes serve as distractors. And I'm comparing our younger and older adults. And here are the data from our very first um, study. Uh, young adults are in are in uh, are the dark bar uh, are on the left of the screen, and older adults are on the right of the screen. The X strings are the um, darker bars. So this is about how long it takes 40 seconds on average for young adults to read the passages with X strings in it. And then there's a slowdown when they have to read passages with words in them and make the kind of mistake that I made, although most young adults make very few of those mistakes. Here are older adults. They're slower to read the extreme passages, but they're differentially slowed by the presence of words in the um, environment. Uh, so even something as skilled, our older adults are very highly educated. So, and many of them read out loud regularly to their grandchildren, they report to us. And so even though it's a skill that's actually better, it often uh, practiced in older adults, um, they are differentially impaired by um, distraction. So the second study that I'm going to show you uh, is one of a series of studies as well, using perceptual speed tests. So I'm not sure how many of you are um, come from the individual differences, fluid intelligence literature, does anybody have that background? So perceptual speed is a task that's been, uh, these tasks are uh, very simple tasks, and all you have to do is make some simple comparison, say whether two things are the same or different. They could be pictures, they could be numbers, they could be words, and basically you get a piece of paper and you go through this piece of paper as quickly as possible, and people count how many you get correct in, let's say, 30 seconds. Um, and that score actually does a terrific job of predicting your full scale, well, your fluid, in, the fluid intelligence component of a full scale IQ score. So these fluid intelligence tasks are widely used in the developmental literature with kids, and they're also widely used in the aging literature because one of the things that happens with age is that people go, 
slower. And our question, having looked at what these perceptual speed tasks look like, our question was to what degree does the distraction on the page actually contribute to the apparent slowing that older adults show? So just to give you a sense of what this task is like, we took a standard task that's widely used in individual difference literature. Here you're comparing letter strings. And all you have to do is indicate whether the letters on either side of the bar are the same or different. Uh, in the paper and pencil version of this task, you get, I've forgotten, 50 or so of these strings on a page. We computerized this, and as you know, you can't cram 50 of these, as you might imagine, you can't cram 50 of these onto a computer screen, so we did manage to cram something like 25 of them onto a computer screen at a time, and we compared how quickly younger and older adults could do this very simple comparison. So, for example, here they should say different, here I think they should say same, here it looks like different, and so on and so on. Uh, so, uh, people either got the cluttered display or they got the task one at a time, the very same strings. And what we're looking at is how long it takes them to make a correct decision as a function of whether or not distraction is present. And here are the data, and this isn't the greatest slide, so let me just uh, walk you through this. Starting with, uh, so down here, um, we have string length. Uh, you notice we had three, six, and nine. Maybe you notice we had three, six, or nine letters. In the actual speed test, they go up to 15 or even 18 letters or digits if you were comparing. So we have a much stripped down version of what the actual version looks like. So what you notice, first of all, is that everybody is getting slower as string length increases. And the first thing to look at is What's the impact of distraction on young adults doing it one at a time versus doing the cluttered display? So the impact of distraction on young adults is nil because it makes absolutely no difference to young adults whether or not there are other items on the computer screen. Older adults on average, as you can see, are slower. Like young adults, they're slowing down as the string length gets longer. But unlike younger adults, Unlike young adults, they are bothered by the presence of distraction. So just simply having other problems on a page slows older adults in a way that has no impact whatsoever on young adults. So a piece of the story of older adults being slow has got to do with, in part, how we measure slowing. So our tasks, one way you can look at this is to just say that our tasks are set up to discriminate against people who are over 60. No fair. But as it happens, it reveals to us something that's actually very interesting about older adults. It's quite different from young adults, and that is the problem of clutter in the environment. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a very different task, and this is just to show you the range of ways in which the performance of older adults can be impacted. This is a verbal problem-solving task, and the data actually come from a colleague of mine, Cynthia May, and this task uses the remote associates task, which is a very old task in psychology, which is thought to be a measure, or can be used as a measure of creativity. So what happens in this task is that you get three words that are unrelated to each other, but that can be related to each other by a missing fourth word. So it's a remote associate. And uh, to spare you any pain, the solution to this triplet is sick. Seasick, homesick, sick stomach. So the task is simply that you get a series of triplets and you have to come up with the, the missing word that relates these items. Now, actually the task was a little more complex than that because some of the items were presented, the triplets were presented by themselves and some of the triplets were presented with distractors underneath them, which people were told to ignore. The distractors were picked um, 
to, uh, in this condition, mislead people from the solution. So C and Horace are related to each other, but they've got nothing to do with being sick. House and home are related to each other, but really they have nothing to do with being sick. And the question is, what happens to those problems that are presented with distraction? Well, if you can ignore distraction, then nothing should happen. You should solve as many of the items with misleading distractors as you do items that have no distraction present. And if you are bothered by distraction, then you should solve fewer of the items. And as it happens, I've just described for you the results for younger and older adults. I should say, by the way, that when no distraction is present, younger and older adults do equally well on this task. There are no differences for the no distraction conditions. All the differences reside in the distraction conditions. And they work like so. These are interference effects. So up is bad. That up represents poorer performance. Young adults, performance does not actually differ from zero. It's as if the distraction was not present. Older adults, performance differs reliably from zero. The distraction disrupts their ability to solve these um, problems. They solve a fewer proportion of problems that have distraction present than problems that don't have distraction present. OK, so just to tell you what I've shown you so far, I've shown you that distraction in an environment slows reading on a, it slows performance on a skilled task on reading, and it slows performance on unfamiliar tasks, these funny perceptual speed tasks that are widely used in the intelligence and aging and developmental literatures. And it can also disrupt problem solving. So dis older adults in an environment with distraction do not do as well as they would do if they were in an environment on a target task as they would do if they were in an environment with no distraction. So to return to our lady in the museum, um, what, is poor, what does poor distraction regulation, assuming that she's a middle-aged or older lady, what does poor distraction um, regulation mean for the museum visitor? What does she know about the non-relevant? That is, I've uh, blocked out the picture that she's studying, and the question is, what does she know about the non-relevant materials in the museum versus what does a younger adult know about the non-relevant um, materials in the museum? And here's where distraction regulation actually boosts the performance of older adults, because as you will see, the bottom line is that older adults know more about the distraction and they can actually use this information in subsequent tasks to boost their performance. All of this without knowing that they know more about distraction or that they are using this information. So all of this knowledge is tacit or implicit knowledge and the utilization of this knowledge is also tacit or implicit. That is to say, outside of our awareness, Older adults are functioning on the past, the irrelevant past, in a way that young adults are simply not. And now I'll give you the reasons why I feel free to say this outrageous thing. So I'm going to talk about uh, greater knowledge of distraction or the hyperencoding phenomena that we think older adults show that is encoding of irrelevant um, information. And I'm going to begin with two studies that show that older adults have lexical or low-level verbal information about distraction that they are exposed to, and another study that shows that older adults have high-level information or the meaning of verbal distraction that they are exposed to. And then I'm going to give you two more studies. So, be prepared. <laughs> okay. So in all of the studies that I'm going to talk about, there are common procedures. The task varies, but the sequence of events is similar. You come in and you're asked to participate in a series of studies. The first task presents a target task and some distraction. The distraction in all of these studies is always verbal. Then there are, for about 10 minutes, you do one or more nonverbal tasks, filler tasks that deal with things that have nothing to do with verbal materials. Uh, so you might be asked to trace a series of mazes for 10 minutes, say. And then your third task is the implicit test for knowledge of distraction. 
And um, the tasks we've used are fragment completion, which I'll explain, like doing a crossword puzzle, uh, problem solving, like the remote associates task, and memory, uh, standard memory tasks from the cognitive literature. Okay. So th these are the data from the first of these studies showing that knowledge of distraction from the past impacts on performance for older adults in a way that it does not for young adults. So uh, this first task is not one that you've seen so far. Um, the encoding task is what's called a one-back task. It's mindlessly simple. You see a series of pictures of familiar objects that go by at about a second an item. And all you have to do is press a button whenever two identical pictures appear in a row. And I'll show you these in a sec. Superimposed on the pictures are either non-words, strings of letters, or words, letters, which people are told to ignore because they have nothing to do with the critical task, which is simply pressing a button whenever you see two identical pictures in a row. And then there's a filler task, and then there's a final test task, which is fragment completion, this um, crossword puzzle-like task. So let me show you um, what, this, uh, what these materials look like in the first phase. So here's a picture of a bell, and it's superimposed by a non-word. And here's a picture of an artichoke, and it's superimposed by a word. So these go by at the rate of one picture a second, maybe even less, so it looks like so. There's a filler task, and then there is the critical word fragment completion task. So the word fragment completion task gives you letter frames, word frames, uh, as, in a cross, as in a crossword puzzle, and you're asked to just fill those fragments with the first word that um, comes to mind. Most of the fragments cannot be completed with words that were presented as superimposed words in the first phase, but some of them can. So I think you saw supply, liver, and lottery as superimposed words. And what we're interested in is the degree to which the distraction from the past boosts the likelihood of solving those uh, verbal problems with those exact words. So I should say, once again, in this task, older and younger adults don't differ on the control items, the ones that they haven't seen before. They give the same solutions at the same rate. Uh, maybe older adults are just uh, slightly better at this uh, task on the control um, items. The critical question is, to what degree is your performance boosted by having seen these distracting items uh, from the past, the distracting items that were superimposed on the pictures, which you were told to ignore. And here's the answer. These data are shown as percent priming, which basically means the degree to which above baseline, the past is impacting on your current performance. To what degree are you benefiting? Okay, so here's the degree to which young adults are benefiting. The answer is the distraction is just not there for young adults. And here's the degree to which older adults are benefiting. They are showing a positive priming effect. And in this instance, because the baselines are equal, older adults are actually solving more of these fragments than young adults are. So in the case of this task, older adults are using the knowledge that they acquired in situation A to influence their performance in situation B, to boost their performance relative to their own baseline, and to boost their performance relative to that of young adults. Okay, so that's task one. Uh, so, older adults encode verbal distraction, they use it later on, um, they show positive transfer from the past, and young adults in this situation do not. Okay. Here's our second study. Our second study looks at semantic knowledge, that is, use of the meanings of words. And this now uses two tasks that you've seen before. The encoding task is reading with distraction that you saw before, and the test task is the solution of remote associates, the triplets that need a missing 
word in order to come to a solution. So here's just to remind you the reading um, task, and here's the paired associate tasks, and the way we've set up this study is that some of the words that occurred as distraction are actually solutions to some of the remote associates items. This is all done in an implicit way. We have lots and lots of items that can't be solved that way, and only a few items that can be solved with distraction from the past. And here are the data. These are data from uh, younger and older adults. Again, they're presented the same way as the previous study. Percent priming over and above the baseline, the equal baseline that younger and older adults show. Young adults, no benefit from the past. Older adults, uh, substantial benefit from the past. And again, in this situation, because the baselines are equal, older adults are actually solving more problems than young adults are solving. So, older adults encode not just lexical level information about words that they're instructed to ignore, but they're encoding the meanings of those words that they're instructed to ignore. And they subsequently use that information in new situations, showing what in the problem solving literature is called a bar transfer effect. That is, you take information from one situation and you use it in a very, very, very different other um, situation. No transfer effects for young adults. So in this instance, or I've shown you two instances in which older adults outperform young adults, which is, um, uh, you know, very rare in the literature. And uh, reviewers, uh, well, we had a really hard time with reviewers because reviewers believe that there are no situations in which older adults can outperform young adults. I presume, <laughs> to give them their due, I presume that the reviewers were all young. <laughs> Okay, so now our next couple of questions had to do with whether this distraction can actually transfer to explicit memory tasks, the kinds of memory tasks on which older adults are inevitably poor at. So, um, again, this is the same setup as all of the, as the two previous studies. There's an initial task in which distraction is displayed in this instance, it's our reading with distraction task. There's a 10 minute delay with a filled interval with nonverbal information. And then the transfer task now is to study and recall a list of 16 words. As it happens, eight of the words, of, of the 16 words, are old words that had appeared as distraction in the reading with distraction task. Okay, so what do we have here? This is recall as a function of age and word type. Over here we have young adults recalling the old words and the new words. The eight old words and the eight new words, no difference. It's as if the familiarity from the past has absolutely no influence on their performance. Over here, for older adults, however, we have a pretty dramatic difference with older adults recalling many more old words than new words. Again, without knowing that these words are old based on our interviews with them afterwards. And because their recall of the old words is so good, their total recall is actually the same as the total recall of young adults, which is literally unheard of. Here's what happens to older adults when um, there's no relationship between the original uh, distraction and the list of words to be learned. This is a standard kind of finding in, uh, with young adults at an advantage. Um, uh, so older adults are using this prior exposure to distraction to facilitate their performance on learning, even though they don't recognize the connection between these and no connection, no transfer for young adults. So the other study we've done uh, uses paired associate learning. This is another classic task in the memory literature where you learn um, that one item, whoops, one item is the cue for you to recall another item. Okay, 
here's how we do this study. Again, it's a three-phase study. You get exposed to distraction, you get a filler task, you get a paired associate uh, list that has some items that relate back to the original task. Here, the phase one task is the one back task where, oh my God, slides, yes, where you have to do the very same thing you did in that first task that I showed you with fragment completion as the test task. Um, so you're doing one back on the pictures and you're instructed to ignore the distractors. You only see those pictures for one second. Okay, and then you get a pair associate task in which there are three kinds of items. There are old pairs where the picture, in all of these pairs there's always a picture and a word response. And the picture is an old picture for two conditions, an old picture with either an old word, as in artichoke and liver, or it's an old picture, drum, paired with some other word from the list that drum had not occurred with. So the pairings are either maintained from the original list, or they're repaired from the original list, or they're totally new, new pictures, new words. And here are what the data looked like. Um, so uh, we have preserved pairs, new pairs, and disrupted pairs. We have younger adults in light bars and older adults in the dark bars. What you see for young adults is that the pair type makes absolutely no difference to performance. They're recalling the same number cued by the picture. They're recalling the same number of words appropriately, whether they've seen those pairs before or not, or whether those items were maintained or completely repaired. Older adults are showing us, and I should say that this new condition shows the usual paired associate performance with young adults at an advantage relative to older adults. Older adults' performance is actually quite different. They are showing facilitation for preserved pairs relative to new pairs, and interference or disruption from repaired pairs relative to new pairs. And you notice that when the preserved pairs are there, younger and older adults or older adults are doing every bit as well on this task on which older adults typically do badly at. That is, carrying over of distraction from the past benefits the performance of older adults in a way that young adults are completely indifferent to. However that sentence would end properly. <laughs> okay. This suggests, by the way, that in addition to picking up the lexical information about the superimposed words and the semantic information about the superimposed words, older adults are also binding those superimposed words to the target information. They're forming links, even though these items are presented at a one second rate. So they are doing pretty high level cognition without actually being aware that they're doing it, and that high level of cognition can then transfer to another task when they're completely unaware that there's a connection, astoundingly enough. So to sort of verify that older adults were unaware, we tested 12 new older adults on the same encoding procedure, uh, phase one, the one back task, phase two, the filler task. Now phase three, instead of being a paired associate test, was a cued recall test gave older adults um, uh, one trial through, we gave them, no, we didn't give them one trial through, sorry. We just gave them the picture that they'd seen, the artichoke, and they were asked to retrieve the word that had been paired with the artichoke. Liver? Can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as you can see, on average, older adults are recalling less than one item from the original list of the eight that we were testing. Then we gave them a subsequent test in which we gave them all of the pictures, all eight pictures and all eight uh, words, and we asked them just to draw lines to match them up together, which we thought would be an easy task if people had intentional explicit access to the task. And it turns out that they got one, a little over one of the eight pairs correct 
which according to uh, statisticians on the web, chance uh, this 1.2 percent correct, uh, 1.2 correct is at chance. There's a kind of funny story involving 50 statisticians handling this problem on some list serve or other where you can, po you can post your statistical problems. And these people have nothing better to do than solve your statistical problems <laughs> and argue with one another. <laughs> okay. Uh, the chance ranged from 0.1, uh, 0.8, I'm sorry, to 1.3. Um, so we never had an estimate that was higher than the mean correct that we actually got. So in this study, or these two studies, older adults encode the distraction and they use it implicitly in new intentional learning tasks, whereas young adults do not do, not do that. They treat this new task as if it's completely new and has nothing to do with the recent um, past. So our conclusions from this second part is that older adults encode much more information about distraction than young adults do. This is the hyperencoding notion and they bind it to target information, that is the hyperbinding. They bind things together in a way that uh, younger adults actually don't do. So I have a couple of slides uh, to summarize the findings that I've given you so far. The first uh, set of findings were the costs from distraction, costs that were greater for older adults in three different tasks, reading speed, perceptual slowing tasks, and problem solving. And then I show you benefits from being differentially disrupted on a variety of downstream tasks, fragment completion. I showed you remote associate solution, free recall and paired associate learning. And just to drive this home, here are some of the data bars. Um, on the left, this is a reading with distraction with older adults differentially slowed. On the right, um, this is the cost of trying to solve remote associates in the face of distraction with older adults showing a bigger cost than young adults. And then I also showed you surprising benefits, that is the distraction from the past, improved performance on a fragment completion task, on a remote associates um, task, and also improved explicit learning to the level of uh, uh, young adults. So just to remind you of the uh, theoretical view that underlies this research, um, dealing with distraction, we believe, requires active suppression of irrelevant information. Older adults are less able to do that. Um, there are individual differences within any age group in one's ability to suppress distraction. And the other piece of the story that we have worked on for some time now is that the ability to suppress irrelevant information is less effective at off-peak um, times of day. And I think I have a little bit of time to tell you a bit about that um, story as well. It's a very small piece of that story. So um, one of the many ways in which people differ from one another is their disposition to be a morning type person versus an evening type person, to be a lark or an owl. At the extremes, very strong morning type people, people who get up very early, are very active in the morning, get more and more tired as the day goes on, and go to sleep early. Uh, and at the other extreme, there are very strong evening type people, um, all of whom I think are actors and uh, symphony performers and so on, who do their main job late in the day, who are never seen before noon, uh, and who take quite a while once they wake up to sort of ramp up to their um, optimal uh, performance. So it turns out within any age group, there are individual differences. These extremes, I meant to say, appear to be uh, partially to largely determined by genetic differences. Um, so there are differences within an age group, and there are also uh, drift across the lifespan, and I'm just showing you the data from um, younger and older adults. Again, the young adults are university students, and the older adults are people who are 60 and above. This is the definitely morning end, or definitely moderately morning end of the distribution, and the moderately evening, definitely evening end of the distribution. And what you notice are two distributions that sort of fit, the extremes hardly overlap. Um, so in the definitely morning 
and with a lot of blue people, those are our older adults, uh, with virtually no, uh, very small number of young adults. And in the, at the other extreme, the evening type uh, extreme, we have a fair number of young adults and almost no um, older adults. So I, in the future, I keep meaning to take my camera and, going, and go over to our local Starbucks because um, if you go to Starbucks when they open first thing in the morning, the only young people who are there are working. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to Starbucks around 6 o'clock or so, there are lots and lots of young people, and thereafter, there are lots and lots of young people, and relatively few older people. Of course, social things determine this as well, but there is also this um, way in which younger and older adults differ. And the key thing is that older adults, are about 70% of them, are morning-type people. And even if they fall into this neutral middle category, their score on this questionnaire that is used um, to determine this is shifted towards uh, morning type. And I should say, the questionnaire that we use to do this narrative stuff, that questionnaire has been shown to be tied to, to be both valid and reliable. People score about the same across repeated testings. And um, it's correlated with physiological markers of uh, circadian arousal. So let me go back to discussing um, the handling of distraction. And now I'm going to show you Cynthia May's data, which looked at younger and older adults tested early in the morning or late in the afternoon on that remote associates task. The remote associates task, remember, is the triplets that are presented where you have to come up with a fourth word. Actually, the way she did the study was that there were many that were presented alone, triplets presented alone, some that were presented with misleading distraction, as I showed you in the first phase, and some that were presented with leading distraction. So the question is, does leading distraction help you solve these problems? Does misleading distraction disrupt your performance? You already know that's true for older adults. And in particular, what happens across the day? The last thing I have to tell you is that the older adults in this study were all morning type people young adults in this study were all evening type people. So an AM testing time is a bad time, a non-optimal time for young adults. An AM testing time for older adults is an optimal time. So these data are shown now as costs and benefits relative to the baseline of no distraction. And what the full set of data show is that young adults at a peak time doesn't really matter what's going on. They solve the problems at exactly the same way. They show no cost. They show no benefits. This is why, as I like to think, um, the great Canadian novel is being written in Starbucks, but only by young people. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter what's going on. Young people, at a good time of day, are capable of ignoring it. At a bad time of day, they're much less capable of ignoring distraction. And, show, and so they show costs and benefits. The benefits are the bar of costs or the Base Older adults at a good time of day already show some costs and benefits. Filtering distraction is just not something that older adults can do. And at an off-peak time of day, they show whopping costs and benefits from the presence of distraction. And so if you compare young older adults, young adults, sorry, at a good time of day, and older adults at a good time of day, you already see differences in the ability to regulate. And one of the odd things we learned along the way of doing this um, circadian rhythm research was that most people actually test their participants, whether they're young or old, in the afternoon. So what you're doing is comparing young adults at a good time and older adults at a bad time. So exaggerating the differences between younger and older adults, something that really doesn't bother young experimenters at all. <laughs> Everyone wants to feel like they're really the best. OK. So the ability to ignore distraction um, varies across the day. <coughs> and uh, I claimed that while you're processing distraction, you're, you are actually picking up this information. And you're able to use it in the future on subsequent tasks. 
And these are the full data from the Roe et al. study where the distraction was presented in that one back picture task, ignore the words that are superimposed on the pictures, and where the test task is fragment completion, those um, crossword puzzle uh, kinds of words. So here's the performance of young adults at this time. That distraction did not appear, and that distraction is not used to solve those fragments. They show absolutely no benefit from the distraction that occurred before. Older adults at a good time of day, that is in the morning, are showing priming from distraction. They have picked up the distraction and they're using it on this subsequent task at a good time of day. And at a bad time of day, they're doing it triple fold. So you pick up more distraction at a bad time of day, even if you're young, this is a bad time of day, you pick up more distraction and you transfer it to new um, situations. Older adults in general, however, are doing it much more so than young adults are doing it. Young adults do it a little bit, but only at an off-peak time of day, whereas older adults are doing it, picking up distraction and using distraction all the time. Okay, so that finishes the data part, and then I just have this last little bit to say. And that is, um, uh, so people have asked me as I've gone around the world uh, presenting these data, people have asked me, why on earth should anybody know anything about distraction? Does distraction benefit performance in any way, or aren't we really much better off focusing only on target information? And I would say, and the answer to that question could be yes or could be no, but I'd say, that one piece of the answer is that distraction really does benefit performance. Um, it does benefit performance because the world isn't random. What you're doing right now has information in it that could be useful for the future. And there is no predicting exactly what will be uh, the case in future situations. There's no predicting when the irrelevant information will become useful to you. And so if you have picked up this information, you may be better adapted to new um, settings where you can implicitly rely on this um, knowledge. So um, it could be that this benefit um, speaks only to implicit or intuitive um, use of knowledge. But many people uh, have argued that intuitive knowledge or automatic knowledge is the basis of adaptive behavior in the outside world, um, outside the university, where what we <laughs> emphasize, where what we emphasize is explicit knowledge and analytic uh, kinds of skills. But out in the rest of the world, it may be that intuitive knowledge is good enough to get us making wise decisions and behaving socially appropriately and so on. So uh, it could be that we have missed something that's terribly important about aging in part because we have focused really on a skill that younger adults have in space, the ability to focus on a task and ignore distraction. And we have failed to recognize that distraction is actually useful. And uh, as I've shown you, it can facilitate performance in uh, many situations. And it may be a sparing factor in general for older adults relying on um, uh, distraction. And it may well be a sparing factor for everyone when they are functioning at a time at which they are really very tired. So my lady in the museum, if my lady in the museum were a young lady, she would know a lot about that central painting that she's been assigned to write about. But since she's an older lady, she knows a lot about the painting that she's looking at. And she knows a lot about the other things that were in that visual um, display as well. So thank you all very much. And uh, these are the students and colleagues, particularly in red, who are engaged in this line of research. And the support from this work came from the US National Institute on Aging, and nowadays from the Canadian Institute for Health and Research. So thanks a lot. Can we have a question from one of our
web uh, viewers. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good Lord, this is a little um, like CNN. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And she's asking um, if there are any findings on oral distractions. Uh, there, there um, is more conflict on the auditory distraction than there is on the visual distraction. The visual distraction findings that I've shown you, uh, there's no hiding any data. All the data push in this direction. On the auditory side, though, there are some studies which show um, uh, certainly the cost of distraction. And there's at least one published study that shows some benefits of distraction. But I have been at meetings where people have reported that the auditory benefits are not seen in the way the visual benefits are seen. So I think, I assume these data are somewhere in the publication pipeline but I haven't seen them come out yet. And it's possible that the auditory situation functions differently from the visual um, situation. So at the moment, it's unclear what the answer to that question is, as far as I know. Yeah. Um, are you aware of any gender differences? Uh, I'm not. We have taken a look for gender differences because people have suggested to me that on average women are more distractible than men. Young women are more distractible than young men. Um, but in our studies, we've never found a systematic pattern. So I have to confess to um, not using materials in which a person might see these um, sorts of phenomena. So. It's conceivable that if what we did was to play, let us say, because we're in the winter and the NFL playoffs are on, um, and let us say that older, that uh, males are more interested in football on average than females are. Um, so we haven't actually taken materials of that sort, presented distraction, materials that are deeply interesting, deeply more interesting to one gender than to the other gender, and look to see whether, when the information is deeply interesting to you, um, are you able to ignore that information? And are there any gender differences in it? So we don't know that. What we know is that for these materials that are only moderately interesting to anybody, um, <laughs> but of the classic sort that are run in cognitive psychology labs, we don't know, um, uh, we haven't seen any gender differences. We have tested for them, but we haven't seen them. May I follow up with this? Yes. Very question. There's a very large gap between the age of 26 and 60. Yes. Um, is, is there, do we have any insight in terms of when this begins to become an issue? Um, so the only insight that exists, well, that's not really true. So we have a lifespan study of a cross-sectional nature, uh, looking at people who range from 18 to 88. And uh, we've used the reading with distraction task. Um, and in that study, um, the degree to which you are bothered by distraction increases systematically with age across the adult um, lifespan. So we know that. Um, the other study that I'm aware of is uh, some neuroimaging research that my colleague Cheryl Grady has done, having to do with what's called the default mode, or the default network, um, which is something that people fall into, uh, uh, regions of the brain that are activated when people are at rest in the scanner. So in most neuroimaging studies, you have an on, ta an on task moment, an off task moment, an on task, and so on. And uh, this default mode is the network that comes active when people aren't doing the task. They're resting, doing what is unknown to people, but possibly daydreaming or whatever, waiting for the next task to come on. And it turns out that there is a relationship between age from young adults 
Oh, sorry. Her data are from middle-aged people out to older adults. And um, so I don't know the youngest middle-aged people in here, but I think it's 50. Um, so there's an increase in the degree to which this default network mode is activating as people age. Young adults show this activation, but I think even 50-year-olds show more of it than young adults do. I have uh, two questions. Um, the first one is, do you think there's any um, impact of the, sort of the computer age on the performance of young people? Because as I, I mean, looking at that reading with distraction, if you're uh, used to reading on a computer screen, you are kind of skipping and uh, selectively picking things up. So I, I, now, of course, that doesn't, I mean, that doesn't work if you've got a sort of a continuous sure. line over time with your other tests. But as, I, as you were going through some of those early descriptions, I thought those are skills that are honed by through computer use because you're selectively quickly doing things in that you wouldn't have if you were 80 years old and then never right. used a computer. Right. So many computer games have a lot of distraction, you know, things that pop up that you're not supposed to kill and things that pop up that you are supposed to kill. Um, and I'm sure it's the case that people who play that variety of computer games. Or the games, ads that are at the side of the screen. Or, or the ads at the yeah. side of the screen. Um, I, I'm sure it's the case that the more you do this um, target task, the better able you will be to ignore distraction. I, I can't imagine that there wouldn't be a practice um, component to it. So it could be. I don't know what proportion, well, I do know that all of the undergrads um, are busy using computers um, all the time. And if you teach in a large lecture theater, everyone is sitting there with their computers. Uh, probably uh, they're online while you're lecturing. They're telling you that they're taking notes, but they're probably busy <laughs> checking Facebook and whatever, instant messaging their pals and so on, and sort of listening to you out of the corners of their ears. I'm sure that you can practice to get better at attending to just a focal. Um, It'd be interesting to look so, 20 years from now and see yes, any impact yeah, on that age. Yeah. It, yeah. It's in cross-sectional work, you know, there are always generational differences yeah. that you uh, don't take into, that you uh, typically yeah. can't take into account. But we could, for example, get information from our participants as to how many hours a day, well, whether they use the computer at all, how many hours a day do they use it, do they play, play games or just read the newspaper online and so on, uh, and see to what degree that correlates with this distractibility, with the various distractibility measures. We haven't thought to do that, but it's a really good idea. And then the second question, um, I may have misunderstood you know, what you said, but it was about three quarters of the way through your presentation when you were talking about uh, uh, the word reek or the, the, use of, the use of words that have been pulled up that were familiar words. Did you, in fact, ask if they remember that? Yes, they they did. Did. Yeah, I, I thought I heard you say yeah. you'd ask them, but I want to just We them. asked them in this kind of gradual way, saying, like, saying something like, well, you know, you were in three or four different tasks in this experiment, and did you notice any connection among the tasks that you did? Most people will say no. Some people will say yes. When they say yes, we ask them what connection they noticed. And most people will make up some connection that actually may have existed but had nothing to do with our with the thing that we were manipulating. Occasionally a subject will say, oh yeah, those words were words that I saw um, on the beginning. Uh, I guess I didn't realize it at the time I was doing the task, but yes, now I realize that they were connected. We don't use their data. We use the data of the people who don't know. And 90%, uh, well, practically 100% of older adults don't see any connection. And something like 85% or 90% of young adults don't identify the connection. Why, didn't, why don't you use the data that people do recognize? Well, because we're trying to, uh, well, because it's traditional in the literature that I work in, <laughs> and because we're testing implicit knowledge. And so we don't want to have the data of people who may have identified the connection and then developed strategies to use them. Um, so we could do another study in which instead of not telling people what the connection is between the tasks, 
we could say, okay, now we're going to give you a list of words to learn. Some of these words are the words that you saw before. And we could look at deliberate performance. At the moment, we are accumulating data of that sort. So, yeah. Yeah? Well, I wonder if there's any similarity between what you described as happening as people age with attention deficit problems in children. Yes. And distractibility. Right. Right. Um, so, at a very high level, people in the attention deficit disorder literature talk about processing in a very similar way to the way we talk about aging. They talk about inhibition problems that um, attention deficit disorder kids have. Uh, by inhibition, they usually mean motor inhibition, that is the ability to say withhold a response when it's not appropriate. And a classic task that people use is a go-no-go -no -go task. Um, so let's say an X is a go cue, an O is a no-go cue. So you see a series one at a time, X, 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 O. So you press a button as quickly as you can every time an X comes up and you don't respond whenever an O comes up. Uh, so that's a little like a red light, green light um, situation. And the question is, when do people make mistakes misinterpreting the O as a go, as a go sign? Uh, and that's the kind of inhibition and stroopy kinds of tasks where you pit um, a familiar response against an unusual response. For example, uh, when you have the word yellow printed in red letters, mm -hmm. and what you're supposed to do is name the color, not name the word. Mm -hmm. So for most of us, reading is a very highly developed skill, and we want to say yellow, but we're supposed to say red. So that's another one of these restraint kinds of responses. And older adults show those kinds of errors to a greater degree than young adults do those kinds of inhibition errors. And so do attention deficit disorder. I think that's the right term, attention deficit hyperactivity kids. Um, show those kinds of deficits. Whether they also show these kinds of phenomena, I don't know, and I don't know that anybody has used our tasks to address that, or even tasks that are uh, similar. So I don't know that. I have gotten a lot of requests, this reading with distraction task, I've gotten lots and lots of requests for people to use it um, uh, with various adult patient um, groups. Uh, but I can't say I've seen any of the data. Um, so, so I don't know. Se second question. Um, I don't know whether any of this data would indicate anything about multitasking. Is that a, a skill that declines with age because of Yes, multitasking is a skill that uh, declines with age. Uh, it does, um, uh, and, and there's quite a controversial literature in the attention literature about why it is that it does uh, decline with age. Uh, are duking it out in the, <laughs> in, in the literature. There, there's a related applied literature having to do with driving in the face mm -hmm. of distraction. Um, so what kinds of accidents are older adults more likely to have than younger adults are likely to have? And to what degree does a highly cluttered environment, as in, you know, my favorite is Queen Street and trying to turn onto Queen Street from anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, uh, to what degree are older adults more likely to have accidents under those circumstances than under circumstances when there's relatively little distraction? And, uh, and again, I'm sure there's controversy in the literature, but there certainly are some findings suggesting that older adults are more likely to have accidents in highly cluttered um, circumstances. But um, I just saw something on CNN yesterday, new data saying that older adults aren't more vulnerable to accidents, <laughs> driving accidents, but it had no information, no citation, so I don't know what, so I don't know what that, what that is. It, is. it is the case that all the things we've done, there are variants of this that have been done with people with mild cognitive impairment, uh, many of whom are people who are progressing towards uh, 
of Alzheimer's disease. And it is the case that um, those folks show bigger effects of the sort. That we've shown not these transfer effects, because they have not been done yet, although I do know of a project that's ongoing at Baycrest um, looking at that. But the distraction effects are greater for people with mild. The online concurrent distraction effects are greater for people with mild cognitive impairment um, than for age mates who are, as far as we know, cognitively intact. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hashizawa. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. You know, the weather is vile. <laughs> <laughs>